In the Bible, whenever we see defining moments, things that change the world and change life, there are always miracles that accompany it. The six miracles that we see at the time of the crucifixion and resurrection are miracles that tell us that God is uh, totally in control, that he's the one who writes the, he writes the script. You know, he's the one who's deciding what's happening. There is no deceit like self-deceit. And when it comes to the cross to deceive myself, as though I don't need to have what happened at the cross, is loss. Those six miracles that happened during Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection help me to know that no matter what I'm going through, God is there. He's present. Crucifixion was the ultimate way of executing someone. It was such unbelievable suffering. It wasn't just the blood and the gore and the pain, but also as someone hung on the cross, they, they couldn't breathe. And so that what they needed to do to breathe was to pull themselves up. But of course the pain was too much to do that. And so because of that, there was just excruciating pain. It was meant not only to inflict intense pain, prolong the pain uh, that led to death, but to position the person being crucified uh, within, let's say, spitting and insult distance to the people who were watching. Something was going on between God the Son and God the Father when Jesus was hanging on that cross. Jesus was bearing for us his own Father's wrath, anger against our sin, as though God were saying to his own son, how could you have pushed those drugs on those kids? How could you have beaten your wife? How could you have cheated on your IRS forms? How could you have lied? How could you have stolen? Jesus didn't do any of those things, but we did, we do. Christ's death on the cross gives meaning to each of us for different reasons. But I think one way we can receive real meaning, personal, life-changing meaning, is because we realize that we don't have a savior who has no idea what it feels like to suffer. The sounds of the crucifixion, the people could not do it silently. Uh, not only the sound of the hammer and the nail and the wood and the flesh, but the sound the person makes as it's going through their body um, would have been excruciating as well. Um, and the most people probably not even wanting to look. Not even wanting to look. And that we do have in the Gospels witness that a few people followed Jesus all the way to the cross. John was there. Mary was there, his mother. A few other people. And the look of Jesus on the cross, I think, can only be matched by the look of the expressions on their face which must have also been horrifying. Conquer 
read in the gospel that at noon, Jesus was on the cross for three hours, about halfway to the tomb, uh, in darkness across the land. Uh, in Jerusalem, in the springtime, uh, like any place else, uh, the sun is shining straight up at, at, uh, at noon, uh, but darkness across the land. Um, I'm not sure if it was an eclipse that could be explained in that sense, or something totally supernaturally one of a kind. I, I don't know. I'd, I imagine we could explain it one way or the other. Uh, but what I think we are meant to think of uh, is an event uh, many hundreds of years earlier when Israel was in Egypt and Moses was bringing plagues upon Egypt uh, hundreds of years before. Uh, the ninth plague, the plague just before the death of the firstborn, was the plague of darkness. Uh, everybody saw it, everybody felt it. Darkness thick enough to be felt. Something was happening that cannot be explained. 
something dark, something reversing the first day of creation when there was light, something going back to the beginning, something essential to what this is all about and darkness and then the death of the firstborn. And it's like creation has been taken apart. And now we need to create again. We need to give life again and start over. God's presence can exist within darkness. And I think sometimes when darkness happens in our lives, we think, well, obviously God can't be a part of this because God is light. But I've seen God in darkness through blindness. I became blind at the age of 15. And yes, it's hard. And yes, there's moments of severe frustration and lots of tears. But that doesn't mean because I am struggling with the kind of darkness that comes with blindness, not just physically, but emotionally sometimes, and even spiritually, that doesn't mean that I'm alone in my darkness. We read in the book of Exodus that um, the temple had a veil, was to have a veil, a cloth curtain, uh, separating the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, uh, from the, the rest of the holy place. There are sections within the temple building itself that are more holy than others, where access is restricted more than other places. And the most holy place where only the high priest can go once a year uh, is separated from the rest by this curtain. This, I would imagine it would be fairly substantial uh, in order to, to give the sanctity and the aura of holiness behind it. In the temple, the priest would offer sacrifices in the holy place. But once a year, he would bring a sacrifice beyond a, a thick veil uh, a curtain, and that would go into the Holy of Holies, and there he would offer the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement sacrifice. And that sacrifice, which is almost, in my opinion, when we get a credit card, it's like paying the minimum uh, and not really dealing with the debt, but paying the minimum and paying the minimum. And when the Messiah came and when he died, his sacrifice, though outside the gate of the city, actually is the final sacrifice for sin. It is the one that all these interim Yom Kippur sacrifices were leading up to. They were pointing to this one that was coming. And now this one, not the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of God's Son, the Messiah himself, as he dies, that veil, that thick veil is torn in half to say that no other sacrifices need be offered here. The final payment has come. It's been taken care of. And so the, the tearing of the veil indicates the permanence, the, the final sacrifice of the Messiah Jesus. In the Old Testament, God chose to dwell among his people in the temple. And if a holy God is going to dwell amongst unholy people, there has to be some way to protect his holiness from the unholiness of Israel. So he had this elaborate scheme of who could enter his presence behind a veil. No one could go past here. Only the most sacred of priests who had fully cleansed themselves once a year would go into the Holy of Holies. So in a sense, the people knew he was there but had no accessibility to him. God, I believe, when he ripped that veil, I can just imagine those almighty hands whoom, ripping that veil. What he did is he said, come on in. You're welcome. You don't have to stay out there anymore. You can come in and you don't have to be perfect to come into my holy place because Jesus has made a way for you. I love the word access in the Bible. Uh, maybe it's because I'm in a wheelchair, I don't know, but I, I love when the Bible speaks about God's love being accessible. And right there, you've got such a vivid physical symbol of the access, the doors thrown open wide to the throne of God. 
and when it rips in two uh, by itself uh, at the death of Jesus, not only is it saying something theologically about open access to God, uh, but it's something that, that had a very dramatic, must have had a very dramatic impact on everybody who was watching and those whom they told about it. Um, a event that really overturns, that, that, that makes us think again about why it was there. Uh, and that both destroys and opens new opportunities at the same time. I've been waiting for these winter winds to pass For it seems the cold has lasted for far too long I've been praying but I haven't felt you there I'm lonely and I'm scared Seems I'm out here on my own I'm fighting to believe what's good and true and while I'm struggling to catch sight of you I will trust in who you say you you are faithful, you are kind, I am always on your mind. I'll remember all you've done so far, you've never failed me yet, and I must not forget who you say. I've been waiting for the chill to disappear Watered with my tears Will life soon come? I've been watching for these flowers To break ground To spread their petals out And fade the sun and I know faith isn't seeing with my eyes oh but while I ache to feel your hand in mine I will trust in who you say you you are faithful, you are kind, I am always on your mind, oh yes, I'll remember all you've done so far, you've never failed me yet, oh and I must not forget who you say you are. not my own Oh, you say you'll never leave me You have a future for me So I will rest here in that hope And trust in who you say you you're faithful, you are kind, I'm always on your mind. I'll remember all you've done so far, you've never failed me yet. Oh, and I must not forget who you say. Who 
you say you are. One of the things about the crucifixion that I marvel at because I am a parent is what it must have felt like for Father God. He had to turn his back on his son, and it takes incredible severe love and severe mercy toward us for God to abandon his only son and turn his head away and say, I can't look at you because you've got their sin. And all the anger I have toward their sin, I've got to put on you, my beloved son. I can't imagine what that must be like. When I first became a mom and I held my son in my arms, I remember a love awakening within me that I didn't know existed. And I can't imagine willingly letting that little boy suffer. But that's what God did. On our behalf, He willingly allowed His only son to suffer. That is severe love. What a kind and severely merciful God we have. When God created, people. He created them in His image uh, in a way that reflects part of His character and in a way that uh, intends for such people to be united with Him, to be with Him, uh, not just here on this earth but for all eternity, uh, the way it's meant to be, a wholesome life that's meant to be. The opposite of that the opposite of embracing and accepting and wanting to be part of a, a relationship with God that was meant to be in us, that was created to be in us, uh, is to turn our back on Him, um, to want to live totally separate from Him, uh, from all of His characters and qualities of goodness and love and mercy and grace. It's denying our reason for being, wanting to be something else. Thank you.